title of my message this morning is found there in 1 John 4, and it's in the first three chapters. I mean, not three chapters, three verses. And the title of my message today is God's Chosen, Battle-Tested, Tried, and True. And let's go ahead and just read those first three verses, and then we'll get into the message. In 1 John 4, verse 1, it says, Believe, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. And so the reason that I chose the title of this message, God's Chosen, is Battle Tested, Tried and True, is, you know, those first three verses are dealing with the difference or the separation of a false prophet or an antichrist to those that have the Spirit of God. And God's actually instructing us here to try the spirits, to be able to speak to the spirits. I mean, uh, not speak to the spirits, excuse me, to watch the spirit of the individuals and see uh, you know, how it is that they are going to uh, reflect God's Word or not. And what we see here is, let's just focus a little bit before we go into all of it. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So just because somebody claims to have Jesus Christ in their life, that does not mean that they are of Jesus Christ. And then he tells us, look, there's many false prophets that have gone out into the world. And then we're going to move a little bit into the present test here, but he says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. So now he tells us, okay, so what is the Spirit of God that you're trying? It says, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So it's very simple. It's what we do every week. It's what we focus on our entire lives once we get saved and we really sold out to the ministry. We confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh and is God. See, we believe in the Trinity. And, you know, later on in chapter 5, he actually references the Holy Trinity, you know, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But then what we're going to see in verse 3, it says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So see, it's not just enough to say that you believe in Jesus, but most people, you know, Muhammad and the Quran and the Muslims say that they believe in Jesus, but they didn't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. You know, they don't believe that that was God in the flesh. They just think he was a prophet. So do... Uh, you know, the Mormons and, uh, and even the Jews. And I'm going to speak a little bit on that because I just got back from a conference that was dealing with that. But let's just keep reading there. It says, and this is the spirit of Antichrist. So everybody or every spirit that confesses, and that's every spirit, that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now, already is it in the world. So right now, in the world, there's that spirit of the Antichrist. And it makes sense that God would preach that then and, it, and then it's now, because the Bible talks about how in the end times we'll have the Antichrist, and we'll have the man of sin, and the man of perdition, and the false prophet. And I'm not going to go into all that today. But, you know, why did I choose God's chosen, battle-tested, tried, and true? Well, this week, uh, you know, and by the couple of things let me back up here real quick you know if you're going to be serving in a church it doesn't matter what you uh first of all it should be a baptist church so i'm talking to baptist saved by grace through jesus christ but then there's a couple of things you got to look at you know there's a i went to this uh this conference called marching to zion conference and it's run by a, a filmmaker by the name of paul wittenberger and part of that uh, group of individual preachers, they're all independent Baptists, they all have their own churches, they get together because they're like-minded and agree on certain subjects in the Bible, the truth, and they call themselves the new IFB movement. And, and I consider myself part of that movement, but there's a couple of things there that we have to pay attention to, is that when you are serving in a church that does not necessarily is lined up or has... Uh, gone to these things or fellowships on a regular basis with these churches like our church where Pastor Cobb is aware of them but he's never gone to one of these conferences with me. 
I, I happen to think that it's because he's uh, 82 and he serves you know, in, in uh, East Texas and he serves here. You've got to be uh, humble and upfront and patient and kind and diligent when you're dealing with people who might not agree on everything that you think they should agree with you on the Bible. You know, my pastor, not only did he ordain me, but he knows and he knew that I was at this conference. He knows what I believe on all these subjects. And uh, it's never been a point of contention because I've never tried to tell him what he should or shouldn't believe. By the way, Pastor Cobb, you know, he's, he knows the Bible better than I do. He's been preaching longer than I've been alive. But number two, uh, you know, if you're going to serve, you know, you've got to respect the leader, the man behind the pulpit. And even though I'm the assistant pastor, the leader of this church is Pastor Cobb. And you have to respect that leadership if you're going to serve in that church. If you don't feel like you need, you, you, that you want to be uh, under that kind of submissive uh, authority, well, then just don't come to that church or don't go to that church. I mean, I guess don't come here or don't go to a church like that. But anyway, so let's focus on uh, coming back. I just wanted to make a point there because it's, I think it's very important that, you know, God's not going to bless a ministry where you're being rebellious to God's anointed. Because everybody's in a different path in their life. And I think that the most important thing is if they're moving towards the truth and not away from the truth, then it's somebody that I could fellowship with or that I can go, get along with or that I can work with. They might not agree with me on everything or I might not agree with them, actually. But at the same time, if they got the salvation part right and we've got some of the stronger doctrines right, then we can work together in one accord. But we'll, we'll get to that. But so we went to this March in Zion conference and it's a group... The reason that I went there is because this is a group of individuals that's been battle tested and their spirit has been tried and so they've been proven to be true to me. You know, I didn't just go to these things in, in, in the past years. I didn't just uh, on a whim say, oh, this sounds really cool or, you know, I want to be part of something great. No, you know, I wanted to meet these people in person and make sure that whatever they believe lined up with the Word of God. You know, you want to try the Spirit. And I'm pretty sure that when I've met them, they're trying that, my Spirit. And any Spirit that, that comes into their fold and comes into their uh, contact. Because that's what the Bible tells us. And, you know, here's a couple, I'm going to give you a couple of things that make it clear why we should fellowship with individuals who believe on the Word of God, the King James Version for the English-speaking people, the infallible, inerrant Word of God. You know, this has been the case throughout history, that we have God's chosen people. And when we went to this conference, the reason I chose God's chosen is because this conference was specifically about uh, explaining in minute and, in, in, uh, in uh, extreme detail the fact that the Bible makes it very clear from Genesis all the way to Revelation that those that believe on Jesus Christ are the seed of Abraham, the seed of Israel, they are the spiritual Jews. But I'm not going to preach a sermon like that. I mean, I encourage you to go out there and look that up. And uh, there's a ton of uh, preachers that have preached on that. The message today is God's chosen, battle-tested, tried and true. So how do you know that you're dealing with God's chosen people, that you're dealing with individuals who have their, His hand on them, that spirit that they can go out there and do great things for the Lord? You know, before we do that, let's just go to... Actually, you guys uh, go to John 14, and I'll just read for you 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that, ye should, uh, that you should show forth the praises of, what him, of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but now are a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now obtained mercy and this is talking about the spiritual Jew but what I wanted to focus on today is I'm just going to leave you with four points of what how we need to try the spirits and then how we uh, not only try the spirits for good but also for bad the very first thing you want to look for and that's the very first thing that really drew me to this group of individuals and wanting to learn from them and how they expound on the Bible first of all Everything they preach is from the Word of God. See, let's, let's back up a little. You know, when we came to this church, my wife and I weren't looking for a church that had the best music. We weren't looking for a church that had the best building. We really weren't. We weren't looking for a church that had the, the best crowd. What we were looking for was a man of God that preached the Word of God. The entire Word of God without fear, without fear of repercussions, without fear of, you know, being persecuted. He, 
they're going to stand on the word regardless of what comes. And Pastor Cobb, if you've ever attended this church for long enough, you know that he preaches the entire counsel of God. And so, and the one thing that you're always going to hear from Pastor Cobb is a clear gospel message. As a matter of fact, this morning's sermon was a clear gospel message about the grace of Jesus Christ, the salvation, the shed blood on the cross, so that we could have eternal life. And so I'm going to read for you uh, 1 John 14 real quick, but you guys are in John 14. You guys are in John 14, and we're going to be in verse 1. But it in, in verse 15 in 1 John 4, it says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So if we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, well, God dwells in us, and and uh, us in God, right? Let's go to John 14, 1. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And we know this is Jesus speaking. As a matter of fact, we're going to get to some of the most famous verses in the Bible that we use for soul winning, right? But he's setting this up. It says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So he's given us a promise that he's preparing for us a place, and that he's going to come back to take us to that place so that we can dwell with him. And it says, And whither I go ye now, and the, the, and the way ye know, and whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. I apologize for that. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Then Jesus saith unto him, and it's Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's very clear. You know, and one of the things that's really frustrating to me about religion in general is just how confusing they can make things. And you know, this conference was uh, set up for the sole purpose of simplifying the understanding of where the Jewish nation of Israel, and I'm talking about the physical nation, the descendants, the DNA, the race, uh, stood in, in light of the Bible versus the spiritual nation of Israel and those that are saved by grace and the promises. We're not going to go into that, but it's very clear, right? The Bible, when you're talking about a, a gospel presentation, you know, people want to tell you it's by works or you have to do certain things or you have to go to a certain church you have to do uh, certain rituals, whatnot. But the Bible is very clear. For us that believe on the Word of God, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's very simple. He is the way. I mean, when you're looking, asking for directions, there might be multiple ways to get somewhere. But here, when you're asking for directions to heaven, there is only one set of directions that you can type into that GPS, that eternal GPS, and that is Jesus Christ. When you're asking for truth, there may be truths leading up to the absolute truth, but there's only one set of absolute truths, and those are the ones you find in the Word of God. You know, people will want to argue in betweens, but when you really look at it, the crux of the matter, if you really study anything, whether it's evolution, whether it's marriage, whether it's murder, whether it's baby, whatever it is, there's an ultimate truth for that. And then it says, and the life. And people, you know, uh, will want to tell you that there's different ways, that there's afterlives and there's reincarnations and that there's no afterlife, whatever. The Bible says he is the life and it's eternal and nobody can get to the father, father but by Jesus. And go to Acts 4, while, while, uh, while we expound here, go to Acts 4, Acts 4, in, uh, and we're going to be in verse 10, go to uh, Acts, and of course you guys know where I'm going with some of these because these are uh, so winning uh, sets of scripture that we use, but I think it's important that we set up and uh, back that clear gospel message. You know, the very, very first thing that really attracted me to, uh, you know, uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson and the likes was that whenever they preached, there was truth. Now, not all the truth that we hear in life we like, because sometimes we have to hear truth to convict us, to make our life better, and then sometimes there's truth we like because we agree with that, right? The truth that we agree with, it's very easy to, amen, you know, and 
I'm with you, but then the truth that we don't like, you need to be, amen, and I'm with you in the Word of God. But the challenge is that it's not always that. It's more like a amen, you know, uh, but that, well, we have to be on top of that. The, the second thing that really, that really did it for me is to follow these individuals was the soul winning. You know, I didn't grow up like many of these individuals where they wanted to be preachers, and some of them are first or second or third generation preachers, and they've been preaching since they were young, and they grew up in Baptist churches or Bible-believing, saved-by-grace churches. You know, I came to this country at the age of five, and I already had been sprinkled, and I already had been to Catholic churches, and I remember vividly leaving candles, you know, for the uh, idol, the false idol of a Virgin Mary. And then I remember coming here, and we went to a Christian uh, church for maybe just a couple of years, and I really think that's where the seed was planted for me. I, 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 I want to believe that because the Bible says that, you know, sometimes the seed is planted, some water and some reap. And I really believe when I was between the years of uh, ages of five to eight, that happened then about eight years old. We switched over because of my dad and my mom. They started attending the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then I remember going through those rituals. And I remember going through, uh, you know, the Sabbath keeping and going through a six-month program to get baptized. No salvation, but I mean, I, I was baptized, quote-unquote. Really what they did was just dunk, dunk me in water, take a picture, and give me a, uh, a certificate. Uh, and, and, then, and, and then I remember when I, when I turned 25, I got saved. And immediately after that, my business mentor, who was a, a Christian and grew up an independent Baptist missionary, taught me the Romans Road. Now, what he taught me was that we, it's important to lead others to Christ. And I remember him calling me on a regular basis, you know, who have you led to the Lord lately? But what he taught me was a one-on-one -on -one or wherever you are, preach. And I'm all for that. You should, anywhere you are, if you have the opportunity and the Lord lays it on you, you should preach the word of God. But what I really enjoy about uh, learning more from the Bible is the Bible is very clear that we should also go out into the highways and the hedges as much as possible. You know, in, in the book of Acts, they went out daily preaching. And, and uh, teaching about the Word of God, right? And so one of the things that, they, that, that uh, these group of individuals do is they go out soul winning. And we've now taken uh, the opportunity to have a strong soul winning program here where we go out every week, on a minimum every week, and we go out and knock on doors and give the gospel. And, uh, but that's what, you know, you've got to have a clear gospel message if you're going to do that. Because you know who else knocks on doors? The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's not soul winning, that's just wasting your time. Actually, it's even worse than wasting your time. It's sending people to hell and making them twice the child of hell. So we have to be very clear with the message. Now, Acts 4, verse 10 says, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of your builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. That's easy English in the King James. Any means all, other meaning nobody else. For there is none other name under heaven given among men where we, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, this is, they're talking to, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, 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 the Jewish uh, religious keepers of the day, right? So right there, you know, I've heard people come to me and tell me that, you know, Peter and John, they were unlearned. You no, know, actually, I think that they had the most knowledge and the most wisdom because they had God's word. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I think what they're doing there is they're being condescending because it's just like if you sat down with a, uh, a master or a doctorate of theology and you gave him basic scripture clear as day and then he'd be like, well, let's go back to the Hebrew and the Greek and the eschatology and the dermatology and the biology and the allologies and let's figure this thing out. And it's not, there's nothing to figure out. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And I, I, that's why I left that other verse there. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, 
John and Peter were bold. You know, nobody would, they weren't used to anybody standing up to them. You know, I uh, do business consulting, and one of the groups that I work with are doctors uh, throughout here in Texas, down in the, in the Rio Grande Valley. And, you know, I have to sit there and tell these doctors that, hey, I know you're a doctor and you make a lot of money, but what you're doing on the business end is wrong. Like, you don't know what you're doing. You have no clue how to run a business. And, and they'll look at you, and they kind of get annoyed and they get irked. And some of them have actually just said, well, I don't want to do business with you because you're too blunt. And what it is is they're not used to anybody talking to them like that and actually telling them that they might not know as much as they think they know. And I think this is what's going on here. The Pharisees are like a little like, yo, what's going on here? Who do you think you are telling me what you think you know? But they were preaching the word of God. And then we see in Acts 16.30, you don't have to go there if you want to turn to 1 John 2. 1 John 2. So go back to the book of John, 1 John. It says, And brought them out and, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We use this all the time in salvation. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the house. And the, the, the reason I added that other verse, is, is I'm not teaching you the salvation, uh, how to lead souls to Christ, even though everything we do leads back to soul winning, so you should use these verses, but usually we'll stop at 31, but 32 is great for this lesson, or this preaching, or this teaching, because it says, and when they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all, uh, and to all that were in his house. In other words, they didn't just stop, and the guy that asked for salvation, they said, hey, let me talk to your mother, and your father, and your kids, and your nephews, and your nieces, and your grandkids, whoever's in the house, let's get them all saved. You know, I, uh, I was listening, uh, I got to uh, be in, a, uh, in fellowship, and I heard stories, different stories about how, you know, some churches do go soul winning, but they'll only go like for one hour on the money. Some churches will go for an hour, but as soon as they lead one soul to Christ, they stop. Some churches will just pass out pamphlets. Some churches will just, you know, hang doors and, and hope that the Holy Spirit moves those people to read that paperwork. When we go soul winning, we set a time. We say we're going to go soul winning for two hours. And, you know, if, if the very first door we knock gets saved, we don't stop. That's only like, uh, you know, spark or fuel to the fire so that we can go lead more souls to Christ. So the first, the first thing that we want to do when we're trying the Spirit, when we're looking for God's chosen you know, first we're, we're trying them, right? We're trying that spirit is we want to make sure that they have a clear gospel message. And then, this, you know, the reason I just point out to a clear gospel message is because for me, you know, I can work with somebody who might not agree with me on the tribulation period. I can work with me on someone who uh, might not agree on who uh, the Antichrist is. But if they have a clear gospel message, man, we'll go so winning all day long. Because I'm not going to talk about you know, the tribulation period. And I'm not going to talk about the beast. I'm not going to talk about whether, you know, the Pope or some Muslim guy or uh, President Trump is the Antichrist. I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is how to get saved, right? The second thing we want to look at is uh, that anything else outside of a clear gospel message is an Antichrist. Anything else, the Bible says, right? And so let's just, before, you guys are in 1 John 2, but if, I'm looking at 1 John 4 because that's where we're at. It says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and that is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. And, and I, all I did was just look up all the, because there's not that many references to the actual word Antichrist uh, or the, sin of the man of perdition, but, you know, the, it's, they're all really in 1 John and that's why I have you turn to 1 John 2. But Antichrist is very simple. Anti is against. And Christ is, you know, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, right? In 1 John 2, 18, it says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be manifest, that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And we're going to stop there for a second. We see that. And the reason I believe that it says that is 
because, you know, we know God knows everything. And if you look at a lot of the false religions that have come up in the last hundred years or so, most of them got their start, you know, the individuals grew up in Baptist teaching. Now, they weren't saved, you know, and there's people like that all, every day, all day. People grow up in church and then fall away. You know, if they just fall away and we can bring them back and we can lead them to Christ, that's different. But some of these went out with the spirit of Antichrist. See, the Bible is great when you preach the entire truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. It says that sin is, uh, puts you in bondage, that you're a slave to sin. Well, it's very simple. You know, it makes sense, right? If we're preaching the truth and you're still here, that means that you're free in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if it offends you or not. But when it offends you, you're like, you know what? I'd rather be a slave to sin and I'd rather be anti-Christ, and I'd rather preach a false gospel, and I'd rather preach a false message than sit there and listen to the word of truth. You know, let's look at, uh, let's keep reading in, in 1 John 2, 21. It says, I have not written unto you because ye know the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? See, the Mormons believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he's the Christ. All right? He is anti-Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. And, you know, there's groups out there that believe, that we call them oneness modalisms, that believe that God is everything, that there is no Son, there is no Holy Spirit, it's just God in different modes, and what does the Bible says there? Whosoever deny, uh, he is antichrist that denieth the father and the son. That means there's a father and a son. These, these three are, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, right? And these three are one. You know, I'm not going to play God. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. How does it work? That's what the Bible says. The, these three are one. That's how it works. Uh, let's, look, let's keep looking. Uh, there in verse 23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let them therefore abide in you. Let that, uh, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So, I mean, it's very simple. You know, if you really want to, like, I guess, pick teams, it's either everlasting life through the Father, I mean, through Jesus Christ unto the Father, or everything else. I mean, we can name, just pick the religion, pick the belief, pick the idol, pick the false religion. It's there. First John, I mean, Second John 1, 4, just turn a cut like one or two pages over. For Second John 1, 4, it says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is the love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye uh, have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers, liars, scam artists, whatever you want to call them, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So he's not only a liar, but he's a liar that's against Christ. See, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, you know, I lie, you lie. We, we all lie at some time. I mean, if we say we have never lied, well, then we're lying, right? But the Bible says that if you're a deceiver and an antichrist. In other words... These individuals aren't just lying. Lying isn't enough. They're lying to be against Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of the lie is to be against or at enmity or, you know, at war with the Son, with God the Father's, God the Father with His Son, this, the Son that was sent to die on the cross for our sins. So, you know, we need a clear gospel message, right, for the battle-tested, tried and true, but we also need to make sure that they... Uh, don't believe in anything else. That, they, that, that if they even have a, uh, on a strong doctrine of salvation or anything like that, that if it's even just the smallest tweak is an antichrist. Because the Bible says they're deceivers. Well, deception can come in many forms. You know, it, you, you could preach that you're saved by grace. And, and we run into people all the time that say, 
you know, I'm saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Great. Can you lose your salvation? Yes. Well, then that's a deception. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell because there's nothing that you can do to pluck yourself out of Jesus' hands. But that's the, that's the lie that creeps into many churches through these false prophets. You know, they get up there, they can preach another Jesus, and it might sound like the Jesus of the Bible, but where we, where we really uh, pin them down is when they have the entire gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The entire word, the entire path. And, and it's not just that, you know, it's also the doctrines and the belief systems and, you know, the, the way they understand the Bible and they decipher it. You know, to be honest with you, it's very easy sometimes to tell because most Bible-believing Christians, most preachers that are uh, of our ilk stick to the Bible. They study, they study subjects so they can learn, but they don't use a lot of commentary. You know, and, and if you go to a church where, you're, where your preacher is using a lot of commentary, there's always that danger that a deception can creep in. Because men are always quick to try to interpret the Bible in a different way for their own agenda. You know, our only agenda should be the agenda of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, out there, you know, you've got people who want to buy a Bible and, and they want it to have 365-day devotional, and then some guy gets in there and he takes everything out of context, and he has you read one verse, and you don't take time to read the entire chapter, and then you're running into issues because he told you one thing and you're hearing another thing. It gets confusing. Then the, the third point I'm going to leave you with is God's greatness dwells in us, therefore we have overcome. You know, these individuals, I mean, uh, Pastor Cobb said it before, so I know I can say it here publicly because he's preached on it. But you've got to think about a man who's been preaching for over 40 years and he's been preaching the same message. You know he has some trials and tribulations. And you know that Pastor Cobb has had two uh, boys that he's lost. And I don't know, I couldn't imagine losing my own children. But here's the, here, here's the, the difference. I know of a, of a doctor that is a Seventh-day Adventist that lost his child in 2009. And, and, uh, and, and it's a very tragic thing. I'm not downplaying that. But the Bible tells us that there's hope for us, right? Because our children, if they're saved by grace, we're going to meet them in heaven. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us not to mourn. As a matter of fact, if you look in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time for mourning, right? There's a time for happiness. So I'm not downplaying the death of any child. What I'm trying to say is when, you're, when you have the, the purpose of Jesus Christ, to lead others to Christ, and you know your children are waiting for you, then you, you take that mourning process, and then you move on and you get back on task. And you rarely will ever see Pastor Cobb with a, a sad spirit. As a matter of fact, in my five, six years of knowing him, I don't know that I've ever seen him in a sad spirit. Even when he preaches on the death of his children, you know, it's a very uh, sad and somber moment, but then he preaches of, of the hope, the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, on the other hand, you know, and I'm, picking on, I'm not picking on this couple, I'm just using them as an example. You know, I'm sad that they lost their child, but if they were really saved, if they really had the gospel of Jesus Christ, they would understand, just like David, that you clean up and you, and you get ready because you know you're going to him. But instead, they're always mourning. They still have uh, pictures all over the place. Everything that they do in their life revolves around the death of their child. They've never been able to overcome, and I really believe the reason that they've never done that is because they don't have that peace that passes all understanding. You know, you go through trials, but God has already overcome. Jesus has already overcome, so he helps you to overcome. And then, you know, you talk about this, individual, this group of leaders that are out there, and, you know, you've got uh, pastors who have been attacked by the queers and the sodomites for preaching against that filth. You know, and you got people who've been kicked out of churches for preaching against certain doctrines in the Bible. And not only the preachers, but, you know, you run into all these church members who say, you know, I used to go to this church, and the minute they found out I believe like this, they kick me out, or they remove me, or they shun me, or they, or they stopped hanging around with me. I mean, there's a real spirit, because the Bible tells us that we're going to get that attack. And, you know, we have a blessed uh, pastor, and we have a blessed church, because, you know, God, uh, Pastor Cobb knows what I believe. He knows that he's not the only preacher I listen to. He knows that he's not the only uh, pastor I fellowship with. He knows that I believe 
uh, you know, in the, uh, after the tribulation. And he knows that uh, I believe in the reprobate doctrine. And he, he knows that I hate the sodomites. And he knows that I hate those that murder babies. And he's still behind me. As a matter of fact, the more, the deeper I get into it, the more he supports it. That means that that spirit has been tried. It's been battle tested. And it's true. And then what he does is he sharpens my countenance, as the Bible says. So let's go there to, um, go to, go to Luke. We're going to be in Luke 11 and John 16. And I'm going to read for you 1 John 4, 4. It says, Ye are of God, little children. And have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. See, the world understands each other, but when you talk to the world, they're confused. They don't understand what you're saying because they don't have the same spirit. But one thing we know is that we've overcome because Christ has overcome. Because he is greater, uh, he is greater in us than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in us than he in the world. Sorry about that. But go to Luke uh, chapter 11, and we're going to go to verse 14. Luke chapter 11, and then we're going to be in John 16, in case you just want to put your finger there. Luke 11, verse 14 says, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. This is Jesus. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils, through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils, and others tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against the house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall the kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, <clears throat> by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he that taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. In other words, the reason I picked this is because Jesus is saying, look, I've overcome because I'm the truth, not because... I, I'm with the one that's in this world. I've overcome because God has, he is in me, and I am the son of the Father, and we both have overcome the world. You know, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He's saying, look, I can't be on the wrong team and then pretend like I just went against my team. It, it, that doesn't work. You guys aren't making any sense. And then he says, when a strong man... Uh, when a strong man arm keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. And we know that regardless of the tribulation, regardless of the, the, the challenges we're going to face in life, you know, because we know who's the prince of the power of the earth, right? Jesus is coming back and he... Uh, controls everything and he will come and he will overcome him and he will take it all his armor and he will divide his spoils now well, this is not an end times message but we know that that's the, the the end of the story you go to revelation you go to the end of the book and we've won the victory's ours we've already won before it's even happened so let's just dwell in i mean let's just enjoy that victory go to john 16 Verse 25 says, These things have I spoken unto you in, a pro in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father." His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man into his own, and ye shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. 
These things have I spoken unto you, that it in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good, but be of good cheer. Uh, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, when you're trying the spirit, when you're looking for those individuals that you're going to have fellowship with, when you're looking for that church, you know, God's greatness dwells in them. But see, most people will judge people and their greatness by the flesh. You know, they define their success by the car that they drive, the size of the congregation, how pretty the building is. You know, like, I, and I'm, not, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but that's, those are the things the world looks for. The music, you know, the children's program, the, the motorcycles in, in, in the auditorium, the, you know, the Christmas, the Christmas special with the elephants and the giraffes and, and all this stuff. Instead of just looking at the main thing. They have overcome and they continue to overcome, but not because they're great, but because Jesus has made them great through his blood, right? They're filled with that spirit and they face those tribulations and they face those challenges only to come out better at the end. And then the, the fourth point that I, that I want to leave you with is God loves, God's love teaches us to love one another. Therefore, we are soul winners. You know, I went to this conference Two things. Number one, I, I really like, I mean, there's actually three things that I wanted to accomplish. Number one, I want to learn more about, you know, the, uh, the false religion of, of the Jews. Those that sit in Israel that, that are looking to destroy the world, that are led by Satan. Number, number two, you know, and, and really, I, I'm getting them backwards, I'll, I'll reorder them. Number two, I wanted a fellowship with other like-minded individuals because to pretend that you've arrived and you know everything is foolish. There's, there's things that you can learn. You know, how does your preaching improve? How does your soul winning improve? How does your fellowship, how does your charity and your hospitality improve? You go and you learn from others because you don't know everything. And, you know, think about it. I got saved when I was 25. I was a young man, an adult. So there's a lot of bad habits that I'm still getting rid of. And you go out there and you see other individuals that you can learn from and that you can, uh, you know, uh, mold your life after and just say, you know, I want to learn to do these things, not because of them, but because they have, they're following Christ, right? And then, but the most important one, that was really number one. The thing I enjoy the most is I love going soul winning. You know, we went soul winning all three days. I think there was over 175 soul won, souls won in three days. You know, hundreds of people. Imagine how great of a fellowship it is to see just this horde of individuals, just this huge group of people, and they're not protesting anything. Well, actually, they are protesting something. They're protesting the devil and his lies by preaching the word of God. And you split them up and you send them into the highways and the hedges in groups of two to go soul win. I mean, that's incredible. That's fun. That's spirit filling. You know, that, that gets you, you know, going in the morning. And then you come back. It's so important to fellowship because when you come back, guess what? We're back to being in our own independent churches on our own. And some of us have bigger churches than others, and some of us have bigger soul winning groups. But it doesn't matter because you know that as long as you're doing the work, God's going to bless. And he will give you the increase, right? And so these are the things. And how do we know this? Because we have overcome the world. You know, God's greatness dwells in them or in us because he has overcome. And we have overcome because he has overcome. But then the last thing is that we're soul winners. So if go to, go to uh, John 3. We're going to be in John 3, and then we're going to be in Philip. I mean, not Philip. Philippians 2, John 3, Philippians 2, and then John 15. Those are the last three sets of scripture. John 3, Philippians 2, and John 15. And I'm going to read to you from uh, 1 John 4. God's love teaches us to love one another. Therefore, we are soul winners. It says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. See, when you, when you live in constant fear, and I can attest to this, before I got saved, you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, the one thing that they love to do is this doom and gloom end of the world. And I'm all for the end of the world now because we know it's a good thing. But when you're Seventh-day Adventist, it's, it's the end of the world that is scary. And it's tormenting. I mean, you lose, I, I lost so many, I had so many sleepless nights just thinking how the end of the world was going to come. Right? And it says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment have, uh, have this, and this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God 
loveth also his brother. Uh, love also his brother. And here's the challenge, right? I, uh, I mentioned it to just a couple of friends that I was going to a, a conference about Zionism. And the world is so brainwashed that they were like, oh, you're, you're going to go with a bunch of racist, a bunch of white, redneck races. I was talking to some of my Hispanic friends. Uh, be careful out there. You know, they might get you. you who knows what's going to happen to you? First of all, it's the fear mongering. Second of all, it's the ignorance. They don't know where, 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 uh, you know, where we're headed and what we're doing. And, sec and the third is they think that we just hate people. No, we hate sin and we hate those people who are sinners. Let me make that clear. I'm not preaching Muhammad Gandhi right now. You know, he was, he's in hell and he was wicked as, as hell. You know, when he said, uh, what is it? Love the person but hate the sin or hate the sin and love the sinner or something like that. No, we hate the sinner. Those that are outwardly uh, hating God. What did uh, David say? He says, I hate them with a perfect hatred, right? But God gave us a commandment in verse 21. He says, and this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. Well, what greater love can we show someone that, that we're willing to do anything within our means to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them? You know, we live in a nation right now where it's, it's still possible to do that. But there's people in other countries where they preach the word and they're, they're running the danger of being killed. You know, I talked already about our pastor here, Pastor Cobb. I talked about those leaders. One of the pastors I met is a pastor who flew in from South Africa. He's the pastor that reached out or had had fellowship with uh, Pastor Anderson when Pastor Anderson got banned from South Africa. I think it was in 2014 or 15. I don't remember anymore. He's been banned from so many countries. But this pastor stands on the word of God and he preaches strongly against the fags, against the queers. And you know what? Uh, he's actually had to go, go to court for hate speech in South Africa and they've had to tell him to not preach against it and write apology letters and all that. Well, long, long story short, he's overcome all that. But now he was here at this event and he posted a picture of himself with uh, Pastor Anderson and the other preachers and like a day later, there was an article in a South African newspaper about how he was breaking the law by coming to this country and dealing and, and having fellowship with other like-minded pastors. These hateful pastors that are preaching the word of God. Think about it. How sad of a life is it for these people that they, they, they're just waiting around for this pastor to uh, do something so that they can then write an article. How boring the lives are. And I asked him, I said, what do you think is going to happen? He's like, well, whatever happens, I'm going to keep preaching the word of God. He goes, they'll probably throw me in jail. They'll probably get their way. They want to throw him in jail for 30 days. And then, you know, if he continues doing it, they'll probably throw him in jail for longer. But you know what? He's standing on the word of God. We've got to take advantage right now that we have the ability to preach the word of God without any restrictions. But you know what? If there is a restriction, we won't be restricted by the word of God. We're going to preach the word no matter what. So God teaches us that we need to be soul winners. See, when you preach the truth, you're a soul winner. Why did he come? Because he loves soul winners. Why is he out there preaching the word of God? Because he loves soul winning. And when you're soul winning, you have to preach the truth. See, if you're preaching the truth and someone says, well, well, the Bible says love everybody. Should we love the sodomite? No. They're wicked. They're evil. They're pedophiles. They'll destroy your family. They'll destroy your church. They'll destroy everything around you. The Bible says he, that he's a thief and a killer and a murderer. And I'm sorry I'm butchering that, but I'm just getting you know, fired up. But go to John 3. Verse 18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he uh, hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, you're condemned already if you don't believe in the Son of God. So there's no reason why we shouldn't go soul winning, because people need to be saved, and their souls need to be delivered to Jesus Christ. It says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God well how do we do truth well we preach truth and how do we do it it's an action right we got to take action we've got to go out there and we've got to walk the streets and we've got to knock the doors and we've got to preach the gospel in the rain in the cold in the heat, in, I don't know, I, I, in the hail, maybe not in big hail. It's got to be small hail because, you know, then you're not going to be, go to verse 27. And, and it says, John answered and said, a man 
can receive nothing except that it be given from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. See, so John is one of the original soul winners, one of the original guys leading the way. It says there, uh, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. See, there's a, even in our circles, independent churches, there, there's guys that can, they look the, they look the part, they talk the part. Man, they sound the part. But this is a key one to try the spirits. Who are they looking to increase? If it's Jesus Christ, let's work with them. But a lot of them want their glory. They want their, their attention. They want the light on them. They don't want the light of the world, right? Jesus Christ. Verse 31 says, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he, and, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall, see, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth in him. See, we have to, when we're trying those spirits, once we figure it out, we better stay, uh, we better steer clear of those individuals because the wrath of God abides with them. See, we can create our own stumbling blocks by just trying to fellowship with the wrong type of individuals. See, I would much rather come to this church for the rest of my life, and it, whether it's just me and Pastor, even if it was just me and Pastor Cobb, then go to a big church where the wrath of God abides in individuals, right? I would, and, and if it wasn't Pastor Cobb, then I'd just do it by myself, you know, but thank God that there's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to the image of Baal, right? Let's go to Philippians 2, and then we're going to close out in John 15. Philippians 2, if there be any consolation, uh, verse 1, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So God's instructing us, hey, be like-minded. Be of one accord. Be of one mind. In other words, you guys get on the same page. Look, it's real easy to get on the same page on probably 90% of everything that's in the Bible if we all just read our Bibles. If we all just come to church and learn the Word of God, if we just go out and soul win. See, look, it's real easy to, to, to pick out a false prophet when you're soul winning because we've done it so many times and you go out with so many other people that when someone new comes and they say something weird, your ears perk up, right? If you're out there preaching the Word of Christ and they say all of a sudden, they say, well, well, you've got to change your life completely for Jesus Christ. Man, that's going to perk up because we know it's a free gift. Or, or they say, look, you've got to completely repent of your sins or, or translation synonym. You've got to stop sinning. Come on. Nobody can stop sinning. The Bible says, for all I have sinned. Then you're going to perk up. Right? Right there he's telling us that we've got to be on one accord. Let's go to verse 3. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we see that it's important 
to be of one mind, and that mind is the mind of Jesus Christ. Well, what, you can't get the mind of Jesus without the Word of God. I mean, it's pretty simple. And, and, and we can't pervert the Word because, I mean, just do a study of any of the false versions, and they remove Jesus Christ, and they remove the virgin birth, and they remove the Trinity, and they remove salvation, and they just omit verses or tell you those verses aren't, have no authority and things like that. And in conclusion, you know, I, well, let's just recap here real quick. The, you know, why get along? First of all, why even preach a message like this? Well, because we, the Bible commands us to have fellowship. It says be of one accord. Look, you can't be of one accord if you're by yourself. You can't be of one accord if you think that you're the only one preaching the right message. There's others that are either preaching the, I mean, that are preaching the right message, and they also there are others that, have, that are more learned, that are more studied, and they can teach you something, but there's also others that you can teach and lead and preach to, right? So, but you've got to look. You've got to look at the gospel message they're preaching. Is it a clear gospel message? Right? You know, one of the things that, that I do when, I, when Adventists want to argue with me is they want to focus on the Sabbath, the fourth commandment in uh, Deuteronomy. And they just want to, they want to harp on it. And I'll, I'll stop them. And just be like, look, let's just make things real simple. The, the very first thing we want to clear up is this thing of salvation. And if they don't want to talk about that, then I know that it's not a clear gospel message. Because nothing else matters, right? I mean, if you're going to worship on the Sabbath or not, if, if you're not saved by grace to Jesus Christ, what does it matter? Nothing. It's the same thing as if you fed the poor. You can feed the poor all day long. If you're not giving them the message of Jesus Christ, you know what? They're going to hell, and you're going to hell. So you better get it right. Then... Anything else outside of that is an antichrist spirit. And I want, what I'm talking about is, I'm not saying individuals are, that are not saved are of the antichrist. I'm talking about anybody who's trying to preach a message and say that they're religious and they're using another Jesus and they're false prophets and they have a false religion. They're saying, look, you need to believe on this. Right? And then God's greatness dwells in them. But you've got to judge it. You've got to try the spirit based on the word of God. See, if you're looking at someone because how big their congregation is, or how much money they're making, maybe you're looking at the wrong things. You want to see, you know, the, the, the effect they're having in this world, how many souls they're leading to Christ, you know, how many trials and tribulations they're facing, what kind of persecution they're, they're up against, and what things they've overcome. Because God takes care of His people. And when it looks like there's no hope, hope's just around the corner. You know, God's love teaches us to love one another, and, and therefore we're soul winners. You know, you, you want to make sure they have a soul winning heart. And if they don't understand, and that doesn't mean, by the way, you know, a lot of, maybe a lot of individuals grew up like me who didn't understand the concept of soul winning. You know, I'd never seen soul winning door to door like this until I was an adult. I had heard of it, but I've never experienced it. Some people grew up in that all their life. You know, that's not something that you don't see that regularly in Hispanic countries. You don't see that in Mexico. I didn't see that growing up at the border in McAllen, Texas. You know, I never, nobody ever knocked on my door except Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. What a sad thing that in my 38 years, nobody ever knocked on my parents' door and gave me or them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what if I would have died before the age of 25? You know where I'd be in hell forever. That's why I get so fired up and I get so angry at the Seventh-day Adventists because they thought me thinking that I was righteous in my own ways. That I was so good at keeping the Sabbath that there was no need for me to accept Jesus Christ and be saved forever. It's a serious thing, you know, and then the conclusion is, let's go to John 15, 8. Let's go to John 15, 8, and we'll just close out on, on those set of verses. John 15, verse 8, says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. We were excited and joyful, and every Sunday we get excited and joyful. Is every Sunday a great reaping? No, but when we have good reaping, or we're just able to talk to someone, even if we didn't give them the, if they didn't get saved, you know what, it's great, because we know we did the work of the Lord. That brings joy, right? It says, verse 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruits should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the, of the Father in my name, he may, give it to you, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. I mean, isn't it interesting that God's command is to love one another while we're bearing precious seed, while we're bearing precious fruit? I mean, I don't know how much more clear that set of scripture can be. And he has, we didn't choose him. He's chosen us and ordained us that we should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. See, why does the fruit remain? Because it's everlasting. You can't lose it. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You know, it's not like the world teaches. It has not... You, the only way that, uh, that you lose salvation, and you don't, I, I'm being facetious here, is if you're in a false religion where you constantly have to be saving yourself, but you're saving yourself, I don't know what, because it's false. There's nothing to save if it's not through the blood of Jesus Christ. So you've, we've got to be there, and we've got to do the work of the Lord, that whatsoever ye shall ask of, of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You know, one of the main things that we focus on and we do, and we've caught ourselves, and I really believe, and I'm not, you know, we're not charismatic here or anything like that, but I really, I, this is true. We'll, 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 we'll be so excited to get started on the soul winning that we'll just go. We forget to pray, and we just seem to be running an obstacle, obstacle, and we'll remember that we need to pray. And it's shortly thereafter, and it's not every time, but for the most part, shortly thereafter, you know, we see results. Not always the salvation, but just the spirit is better. You know, we're, we're, we're actually getting people who are receptive to the word. And maybe they let us at least give them the entire gospel. Even if they didn't get saved, now we're making some headway. Because anything that we ask in the Father's name, he's going to give it to us. And sometimes we're too quick to think that we're better than, uh, than what the Bible has asked us to do. And we get out there and we get doing the work, work of God. But we're really what we're doing is our work. We're out there thinking we're going to get these numbers and we're going to lead these souls to Christ. And really what we need to do is just take a step back. And, and let God try us, our spirit, and, and to make our message true. But our message has to be the message of Jesus Christ. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to just fellowship with uh, uh, other like-minded believers this week. And uh, not only that, Lord, thank you for the support of Pastor Cobb and just the, you know his leadership and his, his uh, mentorship in my life and his, uh, and his tutorship. And, and thank you that we found that our family found a church where the word of God is preached and it's not watered down. Thank you for those uh, individuals that attend here and the fellowship that we have and the love uh, that we have in this uh, congregation. And Lord, just help us to go out there and do your will and bear much fruit and do the work uh, of, uh, the, uh, of those that are ordained uh, by you, Lord, to go out there and be soul winners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.